What if I were to tell you that I could predict down to the second a future apocalyptic event? One where electricity and water would stop. One where planes would fall from the sky. One where nuclear weapons would be launched. One that would spell the breakdown of society as we know it. And it was less than 50 years away. What if I were to tell you it was 15 years away? What if I were to tell you it was a few months away? What if I were to tell you it was tomorrow? This isn't just a hypothetical question. This was a real concern people had as the 20th century came to a close. It prompted increased sales in water, canned food, and survival items as the entire world prepared for an incoming unnatural disaster of unprecedented scale. A potential computer error known as the Y2K bug. The Y2K bug, at its simplest, was an oversight of older programming practices. For various reasons, many programs were designed to store a year and a date as the final two digits of the actual year, say 77 instead of 1977. This method completely falls apart, however, the moment the year 1999 rolls over. The two digit representation of 1999 is just 99. So would the next year be represented as 100 or 0, or possibly something else entirely? And going off of that, how would a program treat this date? Would it be read as 2000, 1900, 19100? It might seem trivial, but undefined behavior like this can cause serious issues to a program, with cascading effects across the entire system. One date routine might return 100 for the year, which would be out of the accepted bounds of another function and in turn bring the whole system down. On the other hand, nothing could crash, but supposing the date rolled over to 1900, a date comparison function would erroneously state that the year 2000 came before 1999. And beyond that, even more subtle errors could occur, such as mistakes in counting how many days have passed from a certain date. The fact that two-digit dates cause so many problems begs the question, though. Why were they even used in the first place? The answer being, with the introduction of computers into industry, memory was ridiculously expensive. For some systems, single bits of magnetic core memory could cost up to $1 each, meaning that any memory saved through clever programming techniques could realistically equate to considerable memory saved in purchasing computer equipment. Sparing two digits in a year might itself be worth little, but when spread across a database that could include thousands of entries, the savings were more than notable. That's not to say programmers of the 60s were unaware of this bug, however. In fact, as early as 1958, Bob Bemmer, most famous for coordinating the creation of the ASCII character set, had become vocal about the potential harm that could be caused by this bug, though his talk of a problem 42 years away fell mostly on deaf ears. A similar bug had also occurred in 1970, where programs written in the prior decade that used a single digit for the year could have experienced issues with the rollover. Decades after Bob Bemmer, a 1985 Usenet post brought up the question of a year 2000 bug again. Some responses dismissed it as a non-issue, some mentioned that certain programs may process the leap year incorrectly, though possibly the least encouraging was an anecdote shared by one of the forum posters. He told about how he had worked for a bank in 1978. The database the bank had used only supported one-digit years since 1970. When he asked a systems analyst about what would happen in the year 1980, she admitted she hadn't considered it. The poster eventually added a warning to the program, which would display six months before the bug was to occur and found a new job. And therein lies the major issue with year 2000 compliance. If professional databases could be written without the foresight to avoid a bug less than a decade away, it was even less likely that they would handle a bug 20 or 30 years away. And it wasn't necessarily the database programmer's fault the system would crash either. Sure, they made the design choice to use two-digit years, but given the rapid rate at which computers were advancing, it would be ridiculous to imagine that the code they had written would still be used 25 years away. It would be like saying that critical computer systems today were still based on Windows 3.1 and DOS, or that today's technology would still be a critical component of a business in the 2040s. The problem was, to any company, so long as the system worked, there was no reason to upgrade it. Rewriting a code base is expensive work, and as more things are built around the old system's way of doing things, the task of upgrading everything only grows larger and larger. That's the reason there are still COBOL programming jobs around now, even though the language came out at a time when the idea of personal computers was still a fantasy. As the 1980s came to a close, more programs and standards would be created with year 2000 compliance in mind, but it wouldn't be until the mid to late 90s that the issue started to gain some widespread attention. 
While it was known by various names like century date change and faulty date logic, the most popular terminology would emerge in 1995, Y2K, which stood for year 2000, K being the metric prefix. The next year, a few news stations covered the potential results of the bug, and by 1998, the US government had officially responded. First with the Year 2000 Information and Readiness Disclosure Act, which encouraged companies to freely share information regarding the Y2K bug by offering them legal protections for those statements potentially being misleading. Shortly after, then-President Bill Clinton appointed John Koskinen to lead the President's Council on Year 2000 Conversion, which along with FEMA attempted to coordinate Y2K compliance efforts across all government offices and industry. Openness was a key focus of these efforts in part to aid communication throughout the industry and more efficiently tackle bugs and ensure compliance, and also to keep the public calm. Ironically, one of the biggest problems the Millennium Bug could have introduced wouldn't have been the result of a computer error, but instead mass panic. News media constantly pushed the fears of critical utilities breaking down, from water to electricity to ATMs, and a public that didn't trust these technologies was likely to excessively burden them at the last minute, either by saving up water from the tap on December 31st, or by cashing out their bank accounts. The possibility of such a strong overload on any of these critical systems in the hours leading up to the millennium could cause them to shut down, even if the underlying computer code would have worked flawlessly. While professional settings worked on contingency plans for every possibility of system failures, FEMA encouraged citizens to prepare disaster supply kits with the necessary food, water, and first aid supplies for people to survive up to a week without basic utilities. Of course, some took these warnings more seriously than others. Certainly some people ignored the warnings altogether, but on the other end of the spectrum, some people prepared for what they saw as the apocalypse, turning their homes and basements into small fortresses with excesses of supplies to survive the impending disaster. They made reasonable purchases like flashlights and bottled water, but also shelled out the money for emergency generators, manual washing machines, and even weapons to protect their stockpiles from the less prepared as society and emergency services broke down. Y2K panic became a lucrative business as the year 1999 progressed, and many opted to cash in on the craze, from preparation conventions, to books including a survival cookbook, to an hour-long instructional preparation video narrated by the late Leonard Nimoy. Because their technological innovations were too far ahead of their human judgments, human foresight. All of these presented an apocalyptic post-bug scenario where humanity would be devastated as all computer systems that power daily life would fail. To some, these dire predictions for the year 2000 matched the biblical prophecy of the end times, and many believed it would bring the end of the world altogether. Of course, these groups were in the minority, and while the general public was uneasy about the coming millennium, most people weren't prepared for the worst. Y2K and the related panic grew to become a cultural icon as the end of the year progressed, being satirized nearly as often as it was being taken seriously. Y2K, Y2K, Armageddon's here. Computers are all set to blow and blood will flow like beer. Hey! As some people prepared for the worst and prayed for the best, and others laughed at them though, businesses were still frantically dealing with compliance testing. The US government had reported almost all critical systems to be Y2K compliant by September of 1999, although the private sector was much further behind. Some businesses put off compliance concerns until far too late, creating a surge in demand for IT specialists that the United States workforce alone couldn't meet. Businesses needed to look elsewhere for talent, and that elsewhere just happened to be India. The country turned out to be an untapped gold mine in terms of technological talent, with the added bonus that, given the country's import restrictions of the 1980s, many of the programmers were trained on the exact legacy systems that they would be hired to fix. Outsourcing technical work to India was largely popularized with Y2K, and with the reputation gained from their patching jobs, Indian programmers would continue to see an increased presence in IT work throughout the 2000s. Back in the US though, Y2K business was frantic as usual. On New Year's Eve, while many were home with their families, tech professionals were at work, set up in command centers to monitor their systems for any Y2K issues that might arise and quickly respond. News coverage showed centers from AOL to the FAA watching and waiting as the last seconds of Friday, December 31st, and with it the 20th century, ticked away. Would the power cut out? Would planes fall from the sky? Would nuclear power plants become unstable? All that could be done at that point was to wait and see.
And the general response was... nothing. The world didn't end, the power didn't cut out, and the ATM still worked. That's not to say the transition was entirely flawless. Alarms went off for no reason at a nuclear power plant in Japan, while radiation monitoring equipment failed in another, although both were determined to be no-risk bugs. Several Delaware Lottery slot machines and Australian bus ticket machines also failed to work, and certain models of NTT Tacomo cell phones were deleting year 00 messages before year 99. One video store customer was charged $91,000 in late fees for a video that the computer system thought had been out since 1900. On the minor end of Y2K bugs, certain programs failed to display the New Year correctly, shown as 19:0 in Windows 3, 1900 on some electronic display signs, and probably most ironically as 19100 on the website for the US Naval Observatory, which is responsible for keeping the United States' official time. Humanity's transition into the year 2000 may have had some stumbles, but as a whole, none of the earth-shattering computer failure prophecies some had dreamed up had turned out to be true. The overall bug outcome of that night was far less than was anticipated, and news response was optimistic. The professionals held out from making any sweeping claims until after January 3rd, the first business day of the new year. And though public fears of a Y2K-related bug had mostly dissipated by them, some also watched for a March 1st bug, in the event that some software might not handle the leap year correctly. Altogether, after $308 billion was spent worldwide in compliance testing and patchwork, the Y2K apocalypse never showed. To some, in hindsight, the entire phenomenon looked like a hoax, and soon after the new year, many people were returning their stockpiled survival guides. A Slovenian official even lost his job due to claims that he exaggerated the extent of Y2K bugs. To some extent, the claims that Y2K hype went too far are valid. Countries like South Korea and Italy that spent very little to test for compliance saw about as many bugs as countries who spent the most, like the US and the UK. Some estimates suggested that the United States overspent on compliance testing by up to 30%. At the same time though, to say that the Y2K bug didn't show up at all would be a lie. All of the minor problems it introduced were proof that, had the more critical systems not been tested in patches, any number of possible compliance issues could have brought them down. All of the patching work also acted as an excuse for many companies to upgrade at a time when they normally would hold out from making such expensive purchases. The French telecom company, Neuf Segetel, for example, was glad to have spent $33 million on new equipment since it meant their network was completely modernized. Oddly enough, the fear of lost productivity due to Y2K-related bugs ended up creating more efficient, productive, and robust systems for companies in the 21st century, and this robustness would be put to the test the very next year. Following the September 11th attacks on the World Trade Center in New York, telecom, transportation, power, and financial systems were destroyed. But, thanks to backup systems, test scripts, and contingency plans that have been developed as Y2K precautions, most of these were able to bounce back in near full capacity within a day. Y2K didn't spell the end of date bugs, and there are still some even within the near future, the most notable being Y2K38, or January 19th, 2038, when the 32-bit signed clock at the core of many Unix systems will tick over to December 13th, 1901. This bug is less than 20 years away now, but thanks to the popularization of 64-bit machines already in the present, Y2K38 compliance issues are already underway. Even further into the future, some have facetiously mentioned the Y10K issue, when four-digit representations of the current year will no longer be enough. At present though, this remains an issue solely for the users of the Holocene calendar. As for Y2K though, while the overall response for the bug ended up being a net positive, causing a modernizing leap for many companies as they took a step into the new millennium, it showed the tremendous impact that one faulty programming standard can have. No other coding decision has had such a massive impact on programming practices, on government spending, on pop culture. All the indirect results of a little punch card trick. The legacy Y2K leaves is one of caution for future programmers. Get it right the first time, build systems to last, and when a potential future bug arises, fix it sooner rather than later. Your work may just stop the end of the world as we know it.